When I was about 20, 21, 22, that sort of age, I had a friend who would suggest periodically to me and the other friends in our group that we should all chip in uh, and buy like a massive house together, like a mansion or something. And then we could all live together and get a big garage for our cars and have shared pets and have a shared life. Just all of us um, as like young adults doing that rather than living the conventional sort of way. And I kind of wonder if now that was really a sort of wish to retreat from society, go outside society's norms, albeit by buying a house. Because this same friend would also, the years before this, the same friend would also kind of speculate wistfully about like buying a cabin in the woods with just a dog and also a pet duck. Uh, since then he's given up on the dog and the duck. Well, since then he's given up on the duck, but he has a dog and he also has a wife now. He's married, living in, his, in a house. So he's joined society, I suppose. Uh, and the reason I'm talking about all this is that exiting society and entering society are sort of the themes of the book for today's episode, which is Lenin's Kisses by Yan Lian Ke. And with me in the interview to talk about that book is Pyotr or Peter Mahayek, we're going to be talking about, well, the book and looking at it from about every possible angle that you can. I will flag one thing before I go to the new segment. So it, the book is called Lenin's Kisses. The original Chinese name is uh, Shou Hua. You'll hear me initially referring to it as Shuo Hua, which is stupid because I've, I've realized that's wrong before. But the reason that I had this error, and you'll hear me talk about this in, in the interview, is that in the copyrights page, for the uh, vintage edition, someone's written for the pinyin for the Chinese title, Shuo Hua, and they haven't put the Chinese characters. So that's what I was going off. So I, I apologize, but I am going to point the blame at someone else, which is the mature thing to do, I think. So yeah, uh, speaking of mature things, we're, we're going to go on to the news, the translated Chinese fiction news. So first up, we have a public a republication in a way of a book. It's Golden Age by Wang Xiaobo. And this is an author who I've not read anything by, but I think I have been recommended a few times. And this is an interesting one because um he's a huge deal in the Chinese literary landscape, or at least he was in I think around like the nineties. I think that was his peak, more or less. He's a sort of uh, edgy out there writer. He wasn't a member of the League of Writers. If you want to know more about him, there's a whole article in the New York Times that I've linked to in the show notes where you can read about the book. Um, and if you look it up on Twitter, you'll see some people talking about the translation history of this book. There was a previous edition, it was called something like Wang in Love and Bondage, rather than, I think, I believe Golden Age is a more direct translation of the Chinese title. So this is a somewhat significant event for bringing big name Chinese literary authors into English. So it's, I figured it was worth a new spot. Even if I believe this is not brand new news, I believe this is news from a month or so ago that I missed, but thought I'd flag it anyway. Next news item, there's a lot of stuff drawn from Twitter this time around. So this is something, the link in the, link in, uh, the show notes will just take you to Twitter. It's something mildly interesting uh, that friend of the pod, Dylan Levi King, found. It's a list uh, from, I believe, a magazine or a journal of some kind that ranks 60 different authors, um, and they're ranked according to what readers thought of them and what experts thought of them, and then there's an average score. It's all in Chinese, but obviously all you've got to do is be able to read numbers up to 100 and read the author's names. So like with my limited uh, Chinese reading ability, I can see that Lu Xun has ranked first place with straight 100s, uh, and then we have in here, I can see... Zhang Ailing, Shen Songwen, Lao Shi, there's one I should recognize but I don't. Then there's Jia Pinghua, Ba Jin, and then another one again, something Ma I should recognize but I don't. Uh, Yu Hua, Wang An Yi, Mo Yan, and so on and so on and so on. So yeah, um, if you have a sort of middling Chinese reading skills, that's all you'll need to be able to understand understand and read this document and see the discrepancies in scores as well as the matches. So for example, Lushun, like I said, has got straight 100s, but then in authors like San Mao, you see some discrepancy. So San Mao got a low score of 22 from the experts, 
but got a score of 85 from the readers, which is an interesting outlier. So yeah, go have a look. Uh, next news item. Uh, it's, yeah, like I said, more Twitter news, I'm afraid. Uh, it's more, another thing about a big name author from, I guess, sort of around the 90s. It's Wang Shuo. He has uh, joined, I think, possibly rejoined. I don't know if he's been here before, but he has joined Twitter and has announced a new book uh, that's going to be coming out somewhat soonish, I believe. Interestingly, he's some of the tweets he's put out since joining, he has deleted. Um, he's only got two up right now. So whoever's behind this count, and we're assuming it's him, um, he's being, I guess, what's the word? I don't know if careful is the word, but he's he's managing it. And he's already racked up 18.5 thousand followers. So something's going on there. Okay, last news item. This one is from Paper Republic. So I'm getting through these quite quickly today. Part of that. So it's a, a, a poet that Paper Republic has profiled. She's called Wu Ang, and she's been translated by Alice Xiang. So there's a little uh, bio about this poet, and then there are several poems sort of done bilingually, first in English and then in the original Chinese. I'm just going to count them. So we got one called Transnational Marriage, one called Breasts, one called Sardines are a cheap variety of fish. Very good name one called Sculpture Theatre, and that's your lot. And it being Paper Republic, you are free to leave a comment underneath it. Uh, no one's done that yet, but I'm sure the good people at Paper Republic would be very welcome, uh, very happy to, and would be happy to welcome your thoughts. There you go, I got it out in the end. That is the full gamut of the news segments for this episode. So I'll just say, enjoy the interview. Let's, let's march on and hear what me and Piotr had to say about Lenin's kisses. So I'm on the show with Piotr Mahayek. It's great to have you here. We're going to be talking about Lenin's kisses by Mr. Yan Ke. Before we do that, though, I welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your connection to Chinese literature. Hi Angus, hi everyone. Thanks for having me. And I'm really glad to be here. I was I was really looking forward to it for for past few months. So yeah, I am I am Peter and I'm from Poland. And now I pursue my PhD. I studied Sinology and after that I went to China to Shanghai to study translation and this is where my this is where and when my interest in Chinese literature uh, began. Uh, I switched from Chinese politics and Chinese philosophy. And after receiving my master's degree, which happened during the pandemics, so many things happened remotely at the time, I, I started to pursue my PhD at University of at the University of Social Sciences uh, Sciences and Humanities, SWPS University in Warsaw, and now I study, I uh, I research uh, the correlations between world literature and Chinese literature. That is mainland Chinese literature. To me, I narrow it down after 1989. So I okay. still read Chinese literature, both in translation and and in original. Uh, well, not as exclusively, not as inclusively in translations as Angus does. But yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to catch up, but you know, it's, it's, it's hard. And yeah, I think, I think that it, that, that's it. Uh, I do translate myself and i and i and i dream of and i dream of translating some some splendid chinese novels to, to polish to my native language uh, right now i'm working on a book but it's not literature unfortunately so maybe that's for that's for another time maybe this one you can talk about it if you want well it's it's related to it's mostly about traditional chinese culture of embroidery and yes. and and those local customs related to it and related to this to this sense of fortune in life 
which may be of some use when we when we discuss some parts of the novel and some some little things that Yin Yang K uh, does here with with the, with the structure of the text. But you know, let's not uh, let's not uh, let's not spoil it right now. <laughs> right. I'm I'm really curious. So you said you switched from studying Chinese politics and philosophy to literature. So I guess literature is your number one. But if you had to decide what's number two, what's number three, uh, would you put philosophy above the uh, politics or politics above the philosophy? Well, those are those are really interconnected in China. I mean, right. the the main concern of Chinese politics is how to how to govern the state how to live how to manage the society and how to live within it so so it is it is all politics uh, it is all it is all right. politics and i i do not want to create this image that everything in china is so political that you cannot discuss it without without mentioning ccp but you know everything in in, in chinese thought is more relational so and when when it becomes relational, it becomes politics because there is something more than than just you, than just you this 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 one person, and this one person isolated from the outside world. So uh, it, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. But I, if I had to, if I had to, I would I would say politics before before the, the philosophy, sadly, sadly. <laughs> um, this is a weird question, but have you ever seen the 1980s film, The Fly, starring Jeff Goldblum? Well, this is, this is, this is, not, my, this is not my strong side, the movies. I'm, okay. I'm sorry, I, I haven't seen it, but you, you, can, That's you fine. can elaborate on it. I'm going to, don't worry. Um, so there's a, a, the plot of that one basically, uh, it's parodied, parodied in The Simpsons. That's how some people might know it from one of the Treehouse of Horror episodes. But basically, Jeff Goldblum is a scientist. He has a teleporter. Uh, he goes in one end. A fly accidentally goes in the other. And then he starts turning into this monstrous sort of fly creature. And the woman who has been like seeing him has to kind of watch this happen. And there's a scene where he's trying to like have his last conversation with her, basically telling her like go away, don't don't get close. And he asks her, um, have you ever heard of insect politics? You haven't, because insects don't have politics. They're very brutal. They don't, like, they don't give a shit. Um, and it's a way to say, like, I'm going to become, a, like, an animal, basically. But I, th I, I think about that occasionally, because people think the word politics, the average person, they hear politics, they hear politician, and it's a bad thing no one likes it but it the what is the basic definition of politics it's something like a way to manage conflicts of interest in society because if we don't manage the conflicts of interest we're just in a permanent sort of war against each other and although it i think i'm stretching it a bit to tie that back to lynn's kisses but like the idea of how do you fit into society or how do you refuse to engage with society that's a big 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 part of the book yeah. <laughs> and how much are you an animal in society rather than a civilized human being? That's definitely there as well. This is this is just one of uh, quite a few notions that that we think of in some negative way while they they are pretty pretty neutral in China. Though the same thing is with propaganda or ideology. Ideology brings some connotations with Stalin or Hitler and this kind of stuff and all ideology is dangerous. This is not quite the case in China. Same thing with propaganda. They propaganda is just what they do is 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 a way of kind of informing and forming and forming the the citizen, but not in a kind of brainwashing manner that we that we tend to think of when we say this is propaganda, Chinese propaganda, Western propaganda, this kind of this kind of stuff. So so yeah, we should we should keep all 
all that in mind when reading Chinese literature in general, when reading, when reading contemporary Chinese literature in general. And it, the, there are yeah. not quite the same things here and there. Yeah, I remember when I was living out there, whether it was in work or just in conversations, Chinese friends would sometimes say to me in English, like, we need to do some propaganda for this. And the word they should have used in English would be promotion. But um, I believe, I think I'm taking this from, uh, oh God, what's the guy called? The documentary filmmaker, Adam Curtis. Adam Curtis. Mm -hmm. I think he pointed out in one of his documentaries that prior to World War II in like the US, the UK, and maybe other European countries, but like the English speaking countries, propaganda was the word for like the government's promotion channels for its own ideas or for political parties they didn't have a problem with calling their sort of political messaging or their public messaging propaganda but then i guess propaganda really amped up in the age of nazi germany and the soviet union you can probably visualize the hardcore propaganda posters and films from those regimes so and so after world war ii going into the cold war in the Ang <coughs> the anglo uh, Brit UK US world propaganda was reinvented as public relations PR so when I would hear a Chinese friend say propaganda unless they were talking about the government's you know like Zhong Guomeng Chinese dream or something if they were using it in a more common way I would just assume that they meant promotion or um, PR and I might tease them a bit for it but um, I realized that it wasn't anything sinister which might be the first conclusion you jump to yeah, and some of some of these writers, uh, you know, when we comment their writings in the West, we say that they, that there is this ongoing play between their writing and censorship. Some of them, some of them started off as as uh, their work as propagandists, but not in 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 this sense of a word that they would write let's say let's say let's praise the Mao kind of thing they they served in the army and they and they worked as for instance cultural instructors or this kind of stuff and what they did was actually kind of propaganda in a way in this kind of edu educational manner and this is this is how Yin Liang K started it and this is also how Moyen started it uh but these are these are kind of side tracks what i'm what i'm saying saying right now it's just but yeah let's yeah, let's, yeah. let's let's not forget that 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 <laughs> words have very different meanings uh and yeah. if, well translating them correctly doesn't like bring out the bring out the full sense of it totally yeah i've done a really bad job of starting the conversation in a streamlined way but I will move us to the next question. What's been your experience reading Yan Lianke? Like, how did you first learn about him? What was the first stuff you've read? Do you read him in Chinese? Do you read him in Polish? Do you read him in English translation? Because listeners who've listened will know I'm not reading the original. I'm reading, for this one, Carlos Rojas's translation. Yeah, and my answer is going to, is going to explain how and when we actually met because this is this is yeah. this is uh my reading of yin yang k started when i was running a bookstagram account i wish i wish i could recommend it to all of you but unfortunately i was running it in polish exclusively so i i don't believe we have many Polish speaking listeners here. So anyway, the, the channel was something like Sino Books, or where I would where I would read both Polish uh, Polish English translations. Sometimes I would I would I would pop in some some Chinese originals as well. And I would I would just spread the word about what's worth reading. And I had this idea that I am I am going to go through some of those offers like uh, in a in a very intense manner, and I would read everything at least at least everything that that has been translated already, just to give some wow. 
just to give some ideas and to help people actually avoid the stuff that is not worth reading reading rather than <laughs> rather than the the greatest things and this is this is where well this is this is when you actually asked some of your followers what to read next and i was in the middle in the middle of this process mm. and i was really getting into into his his literature into the way he uh he transposes transposes those big big chinese ideas such as such as chinese dream or 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 the whole project of chinese modernization the way he transposes those ideas into his novels and uh, so yeah i was really impressed by it so i recommended yan yang kei to you and this is when we met and this is when we uh, agreed on making this very episode that we are recording right now. So I read like seven books of Yin Yang Kei. I don't recall the exact order. And I must say that mm. Lenin's Kisses is not my favorite one. It's, it is a good starter. It is a good starter because it contains uh, most of the main tropes of Yin Yang Kei's writing, but this is not my favorite novel. So after reading everything that 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 has been translated by Yu Hua, I moved on to Yin Yang Kei, and I was I was I was all done. I was all done when I realized that Carlos Rojas translated just another book, like Three Brothers or something. This thing that basically no one has ever heard of. <laughs> I mean, I mean something that has not been actually yet commented on, and I was uh, at this point I was already a little bit tired. I was not ready for the eighth book in the row of Yin Yang K because Carl. Uh, I mean, I respect the work that he that Carlos o has has done. He's done tremendous, uh, tremendous job. Yet, uh, yet I'm not. I'm not very fond of his translations. While in Polish, while in Polish, we have we have really amazing translations. I must say, we have at least four novels, four novels translated to Polish. All of them are splendid in terms of trans uh, the translation work. Uh, as for my Chinese reading, I read some of his essays on fiction, which are. Which are quite influential, and they do explain a lot about he, his strategy of of writing. Yeah, the uh, I've only read two of the Yanli and Kulas, and they're both Carlos Rojas translations. This is the second one I read, Lenin's Kisses. The first one was The Day the Sun Died, and I've talked about this on the the show's Patreon. But the day the, the day the sun died, the premise is like made for me. When I was in university as an undergraduate, I actually wrote a short story about the sun falling out of the sky, and I think it's one of the best things I've written. I think that idea is amazing, which is that, that by the way, is the premise of The Day the Sun Died, that I think it falls out of the sky, and it throws the world into chaos in a rural Chinese village. So I read the premise, and I was like, I'm so sold. But then reading the thing, I was like, wow, this is really clunky and awkward, and even the structure... The, the the prose, and I couldn't really tell, is this Yan Lian Ke, does he write in this sort of potato style, or is it a potato translation? I love, and... I love the word, the, the word of the day, <laughs> probably. Yeah, potato, I, it's, it's a good one. I, I, I've heard people use it to describe, like, their microphone, I got a potato microphone, but I think you could use it to describe writing style as well, and it's like, you know, it's cut into blocks, it's kind of flavorless, and you shouldn't eat too much of it because it'll fill you up. Well, I, I, I have this, I have this uh, uncomfortable feeling about Yin Yang K that at some point when he gained some some admiration from the West, he divided he divided his writing into let's say two readership channels. And he publishes kind of memoirs, essays, and 
kind of like not very subversive ideas in China, while he keeps keeps going after big ideas of the Chinese politics, he kind of try to mm, mock them or present them in 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 his manner of myth or realism, and he. He he knows that it's 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 not gonna fly in China. That he is going to publish it in in Taiwan or Hong Kong first, and then they will just go to translations to to the Western world. And and those those latest novels, such as the the Chronicle, uh, the Explosion Chronicles, as well as the Day the Sun Died. That I think that this this analogy between what's going on in China and what what actually happens in the story, this is a little bit too straightforward. This is a this is this is gimmicky to me, and I don't like that.、Mm. And I don't like he kind of like lost his artistic artistic value. He 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 just he he seems to be thinking, oh, bam! This is like in your face, Xi Jinping. And yeah, the critics are gonna love it because it's 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 in in CCP's face, and no one in China、mm-hmm. will read it anyway. So, and it's interesting that he's not、uh, he's not a guy under arrest. I guess he's he's marginalized in the literary scene. He's not gonna become、uh, I don't know a bestseller in a Chinese bookshop. But there is an amazing article which I will link to in the show notes in the New Yorker. And I've just—I was on the bit I wanted to read, and I've scrolled right past it because I'm stupid. But it's by、uh, this is terrible. Why have I forgotten her name? Jia, yeah, Jia Yang Fan, or I guess Fan Jia Yang. And she's got another article in the New Yorker where she spends a day in New York with Liu Cixin. But in this article, it's a similar thing. She spent a day in Luoyang and the home village near Luoyang that Yang Yang comes from, and she she spent it with him and. He gave her sort of a a tour of the town. They went for a meal. They went to see an opera. I think possibly he met. She met his mother or something. But the, there's an amazing bit、um, where they've met a, like a local businessman who's an ex party guy who's a fr- an admirer slash a friend of Yen because、um, everyone is recognizing. Yeah, and he's like the local, the local guy in the village that made himself a big name. So everyone is really proud of him, despite the fact he's writing all this stuff that might throw other writers in huge trouble. He just for whatever reason, he's got a pass, even if his books can't be published locally. So there's a bit、um, where this guy, I think he's called Zhang Wei, or is it just Wei? Wei is giving them a tour, and it says, "I'll just read it." Steadying himself on a lamp post, Wei halted, and overcome with emotion, pronounced Yan the pride of Henan. He said that he was sure he'd read something of Yan's recently in the People's Daily, the mouthpiece of the Communist Party, and perhaps the last paper on earth that his byline would appear in. I don't dare to think that's true, Yan said, a hint of mischief creeping into his smile. Then he turned to me and whispered, "No one here has actually read anything I've written." Or knows that my books are banned. To live in China in 2018 is to inhabit a reality that makes you question the very nature of reality. It keeps going. The absurdity of the evening's events seemed ever so slightly to please the author. The people we met today, he's saying, they know the name Yan Lianke and that he's a Chinese who came by a bit of fame. He said, but in their minds, I might as well be a character in a story. And <laughs> as I don't know, that's just—it's <laughs> amazing. That he's not just a, ba- a a band writer; he's also a hero writer, at least in his town. But no one's read the stories. Well, he is being published in China, but not the things we know in the West. Those are those are those are his writings on on his past or on literature, because he he also lectures at the university. So there is there is this distinction of things. Things you can read in China by Yan Yanke and those you cannot,、uh, but he、right. he remains a、uh, quite a renowned name. He's he's not a celebrity author. He's not a celebrity author, and he's not as famous as those big guys such as Yu Hua or Moyen, even though he's named as one of 
uh, of the top runners for the next Nobel Prize, but I I don't think the 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 academy would dare to piss China again about that one. No. Uh, no. So yeah, so yeah, he 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 exists in China. Let's not forget that it's not like he's a uh, full time dissident locked in a, locked in a cage and that he he produces some some is that uh, like like in, in the communist times of Russia that you know, they are being passed one by one. I know I know I should keep us moving, but I thought I'd say as well. When I was back in the UK and taking the interest in translated Chinese lit, I have now. I would any bookshop I went in, I would go looking to see what have they got translated from China. And the only two I could really rely upon finding, at least in Edinburgh where I was living, were Liu Cixin and Yan Lianke. Yan Lianke seemed to be in those shops more than Mo Yan, the guy who actually won the Nobel Prize. And my theory about that is like. From a publishing perspective, his books are easier to sell than Mo Yan's because Mo Yan's, they are maybe quite spicy, for you know stories about China. They're not tame. The thing is, uh, the thing is, they are also yeah. extremely long. I mean, Howard Goldblatt is a kind of translator that would that would would not blink an eye before cutting like thirty percent of the novel if he thinks that this would not go well with 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 American readers, but still but still Moyan's novels are like five hundred pages long and no one no one has time, no one has patience to read <laughs> this kind of stuff, especially yeah. from China. I mean the yes. translation and and we all know that in Anglo uh, Anglo speaking countries, those this translated this translation markets looks completely different wow. than 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 you know other places in Europe. Yeah, that's where I was going. The size, because the books you by Yan Yan that you would see up front and center would be Serve the People and the Explosion Chronicles, which, from what I remember, they're very short. And they're playing a lot with like socialist, communist, Mao, like cultural revolution, ideology and imagery. And that's, I think, what your average Westerner, what sparks up their interest about China, because it's it's a great big communist country that's still communist. You know, it's not like Russia. Yeah, this is it. It, it fits what what the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu would call habitus, our way of seeing world. And we and new information that we actually gather and accept to accept to receive are actually those that build up the experience that we already have and this is this is basically reading china in the west the things that i mean this i i believe this used to be the case for for a really long time i i must say that things are changing things are changing for for the better and in Poland, I must say that this is this is definitely the case, and uh, there is plenty of translation appearing in in English. So I am of a good hope. But generally, for the past let's say twenty twenty years, what Seoul was was actually yeah, uh, Mao is China, big big bizarre communist country some kind of, you know, uh, a book banned in China, the more banned, the better. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. And there's a strong desire, I think, to weirdify it, just like we weirdify Japan to make it kind of funny. And like the only Moyan book I've read, Radish, it is quite funny, but it's not the obviously funny the obvious kind of weird crazy comedy but there's the other one he did i actually bought my dad for it. life and death are wearing me out where like a guy reincarnates as all the animals of the chinese zodiac and it's a great idea for a book but also you know perfect for a western market because it's kind of zany it's undeniably chinese and i guess it doesn't have the political so obviously the political angle i realize i'm really rambling here uh, so i'll ask one more question about the onion cut you mentioned before that Lenin's Kisses has a lot of the classic traits of his fiction. So what would some of those be? I could start us off by saying having the setting as Hunan, that's a biggie. 
Yeah, those Vallow Mountains uh, is the setting where most of his stories actually happen. This is this is his. Uh, mm, I think in Moyen's writing that was Gallio, the the same place, and this is this is. Some critics say that this Balo Mountains is Yen Yen Kei's Macondo, but this is uh, well, this is uh, let's say off 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 the top. Uh, this is way off, I must say, but uh, let's let's put that in the mix. So yeah, the setting first. Well, social critique that I think we are going to move on uh, soon. Another thing is this kind of love and hate relationship between between the countryside and the city which obviously which maybe not obviously but seem to have something to do with uh the author's biography yeah i think i think though and this this kind of a, a little bit of black humor and grotesque is is what what uh what appears in most of them most of them maybe not dream of uh ding village which is the darkest but also the greatest one uh, but all the others this 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 subtle mix of grotesque and black humor is a part of of his of his vocabulary let's say i i'm gonna take us on to the basics of lenin's kisses and I was going to say we could try and summarize the plot. And I have a bit of a cheat uh, a cheat for this one, where I'll read us the blurb of the book. I've got the paperback in front of me. And then we can fill in anything that the blurb is missing. Does that sound good? Yeah, yeah. All right, okay. This is quite a long blurb, so I'll try and read it slightly speedily. <clears throat> Deep within the Baolo Mountains lies a small rural town populated by disabled people. Blind, deaf, and disfigured, the 197 citizens of the village of Livin? Livin? I'm going to say Livin. The village of Livin until now, have until now enjoyed a peaceful, mutually supportive life out of sight and mind of the government. But when an unseasonal snowstorm wipes out that year's crops, a county official dreams up a scheme that will raise money for the district and boost his career. He convinces the villagers to set up a travelling freak show to include Blind Tonghua's Acute Listening Act, and that's always capital letters, and Deaf Man Ma's firecrackers on the ear. With the money, he intends to buy Lenin's embalmed corpse from an ailing Russia and install it in a splendid museum to attract tourism to this sleepy district. However, as we all know, even the best intentions can go awry. So the first thing I'll say uh, about the plot is that that's more or less accurate, but there's two things missing that are big as you read the book. One is the push and pull of the town to do a thing called withdrawing from society, where they want to stay shut off from the rest of Chinese civilization, be it, you know, historically the Ming Dynasty, which I think is when the village of uh, the village of Livin was founded, but or it could be the sort of 80s reform era, or it could be, you know, Mao era China or the reform era. The village is always wanting to get away so that's one thing it's missing in the blurb and then the other thing is that you might think there's going to be lots and lots of pages and chapters devoted to a mission to get lenin's body out of russia but it's all done off screen it's doesn't like we get almost nothing of russia and the fact it's lenin almost feels incidental to me i don't know what you think about that well they they still manage to put like plenty of information in that blurb. What seems to be missing to me is is pointing out that the novel like, happens in, 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 let's say, in two parallel perspectives. Because we have, mm. we have this kind of further biddings, footnotes to the, to the chapters, but we right. should, we, we, we should mind the fact that those footnotes or technically just as long just as long as the actual as the actual chapters so there is and well to to put it simple to put it simple in the actual chapters uh 
in the actual chapters the story moves on while in those in those footnotes or further readings or padding the some translated it the past unfolds the past of 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 living village of how how it all happened how how did they even manage to become to locate themselves in the very in the very outskirts of society in spite of the fact that they live live in 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 the middle of a province technically in the middle of a province and how how did that happen that they do not belong so yeah this is this is what they might have mentioned in a in a blurb well about about the about lenin about his body yen claims that he actually came across such news in uh, <laughs> uh i think it's called reference news there is this kind of there is this kind of newspaper in china it's called tanghao xiaoxi and it just reprints reprints the news from the outside world and in a in a really small form so so in fact so in the, so in fact you could you could get in, into a cab in in beijing and it turns out that 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 the guys that the guys know what 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 happens all around the world thanks to that it's this reference news is used to be i don't know if still is quite uh, quite popular thing in china mm-hmm. and i've just found its wikipedia page uh launched in 1931 it runs in several languages apparently chinese uyghur kazakh korean mongolian uh and it looks like it's still running it- yeah, it has an official website in Chinese and stuff. It does. It does. I'm just, I'm just not sure about its popularity nowadays in in right, the era right. of of the internet. So anyway, yes, slight, slightly he redundant. claims he came across such news that due to due to uh, economic calamities, Russia is is actually considering. Uh, how do you how do you call it in English? Burning burning the body and cremating. cremating. Yeah, thanks. Cremating cremating Lenin's body. And why Lenin? Well, uh, Lenin is big symbolic figure. Symbolic, yeah. It is it is both ironic and subversive that uh, the one of the of the most influential advocate of proletarian struggle, of the class struggle, of the international, uh, is is transformed into a commodity that is supposed to help uh, just gather money, gather capital, gather as much as you know the amount of money that the the inhabitants would not know what to do with it. Uh, this is subversive in a way that this is what what actually happened to ideology in China and in you know, mm. the ideology of CCP, the same the same communist party was flexible enough to switch itself from the hardcore leftist egalitarian ideology of voluntary rural communities to this hyper capitalist behemoth and it still happens yeah. and it still happened like within within the framework of the same organization and it was still and there was and there is still there is still existing connection that there is there is no contradiction in that this is just the way this is just the way things evolve in china and there is nothing contradictory about because in in the west we would say that if if mao would he come back would come back to life he would <laughs> he would uh, he would implode he would, he would go die again <laughs> he would he would he would go die again because he would be so pained to see it but the the chinese don't see it that way and mm. and the, it's the all been Lenin figure this Lenin figure uh, is is kind of a, 
uh, is a kind of ironic commentary to that. I would say. Yeah, like no one, no one in the book is like, hold on a minute, Lenin, the communist hero, you can't do this, you can't turn him into a tourist attraction because, yeah, it's all it's all been synthesized into, I guess, various ideas of building the nation, becoming more prosperous. Like if anyone's ever been a tourist in China, they will have seen a little stall selling lots of knickknacks, some of which will be, you know, a bag with Mao's face in. Cultural Revolution style art, and I guess also if you've been around the internet or China, you might have seen the artworks. They'll have the sort of row of faces where in the Soviet Union you'd have like Engels, Marx, then Lenin, then Stalin. But then the Chinese version, you get extra extensions. You get all of those guys, maybe minus Stalin, but then you get Mao, and then you might even get someone after that. It all can work as a continuity if you. Sort of bend it, bend it the right way, and like I think the irony of Lenin being the figure in the tomb, it almost bounces off me because I'm so used to that sort of kitsch commodification of communist stuff like Che Guevara on the T-shirt. That's been bouncing off me since I was a kid. It, you know, it's um, it's just part of the world. Like the idea of communism and socialism sits right next to selling those ideas. Just I don't know, like a Rage Against the Machine CD. The ideas are still potent, but they're being sold to you by Sony. Yeah, and there's and some people may not may not even see nothing wrong with with I don't know buying a T-shirt with Mao Zedong when in China or some kind of funny poster. While in fact the guy the guy is was responsible for the amount of deaths that exceeds what. What 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 Hitler did? So I'm sorry. I'm sorry to say、yeah. that. I mean, you you could you could you could get cancelled for that in China, but but、mm-hmm. this is this is how it is. And but yeah, we have to look at it in a、uh, well. The Chinese don't look at it that way. They have different perspective. Mao united China, and that's the thing. Mao made China unified, and so. So they just think that all those people and all those calamities were just mistakes, in the in the process. So、uh, I wouldn't get.、Uh, there is no there is no point in getting outraged by by you know by seeing souvenirs souvenirs with Mao Zedong in China. Let's let's not let's、yeah. not be shocked about that. <laughs> yeah. No. You realize pretty quickly that. The guy is the guy is normalized. Clearly, people don't get taught exactly what happened. Like the, I remember a few people said to me, "Oh yeah, I've I had a, a grandparent or a grandfather who lived through the, the famine, the, you know, the government induced famine in the fifties." But it's not like in Europe where these things, at least things that happen domestically, don't get deleted from memory. I just got the sense that. Yeah, maybe people like there's that there's that official statement, isn't there, that he was seventy percent good, thirty percent bad, or something, and then that's yeah, that's that's, that's the、enough. official line. That's the way they put. Yeah,、it. yeah. So don't you dare say sixty、uh, forty. It has to be seventy thirty. I'm glad you mentioned、uh, that sort of、um, the 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 stuff, the, the atrocities, basically the awful things that happen in Chinese history, because. I guess what makes this a book, well, a few things, but the big thing to me that if I was a, running a Chinese publishing house, the thing where I'd be like, I can't publish this because this will get my business shut down, are the sections of the book where basically we're seeing the the famine in, or the starvation induced by the Great Leap Forward because the village of Livin gets ri- is able to produce its own food because it's not taking part in the disastrous policies that Mao. Brought in, but they get raided by other villages that don't have enough food, and they get blamed for hoarding it and stuff. And they are delivered in those footnoted sections that you mentioned, which are, I guess, mostly used as like flashbacks. So there's that. But I feel like Chinese twentieth century Chinese history is dealt with episodically, and often those those episodes are big moments of change or trauma,、um, ripe for satire or analysis. Because the other big, I to me to my mind anyway, the other big moment of Chinese history that the book is having a 
a look at is reform and opening, like to get rich is glorious, because of the character of Chief Leo. This is what I meant to say about the paintings of leaders next to each other. Chief Leo, he's a local official. His big dream is to like just get rich, turn the turn the village into a tourism business machine. But he's also fixated on like the old collections of writings by communist writers and Chinese leaders. He has a poster of like what is it Mao next to all the the big figures like Marx on the wall, and later he sticks his own face on the front because of course. But like to my mind, the the wild place the book goes is to is to depict starvation from the the, the Great Leap Forward. But it's probably more about reform and opening. So I don't know. I've rambled on and on, and I've repeated myself. What thoughts do you have about the social criticism of just just in the book? Yeah, let's 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 say that um, this is um, the social critique about about the modern modernization project in China is ever appearing and. Yan Liang case writing, and he he has distrust for it. Let's let's say that openly that he has distrust for it. He he thinks that that the pace of changes is like is like so quick that that people have no way to adapt, and because they have no way to adapt, they their lives do not do not get better. Actually, it's his his style of mythorealism, realism as he as he calls it himself is a is a is a kind of a way to to settle to to answer the question that Zhang Ailing the most revered uh, heroine of chinese literature of chinese literature asked at some point uh, what if the pace of the changes is so quick that, that the fictional works cannot answer to that? I, I could I could look for the exact I could look for the exact uh, quote. Uh, what if the transformative era changes so drastically that fictional writings cannot follow reality? And what Yen Yang Kei tries to do is to is to catch up with it but but his diagnosis is a pessimistic one the pessimistic one and and we could we could analyze that in terms of biopolitics i love that you're bringing in all the critical theory that's excellent so uh, so when things when things start to uh, open up and reform in china uh, it turns out that the the main the the main areas of that process uh, are the cities. So the rural citizens, well, they are left behind. So they go to the cities, and the only thing that they have to offer is their bodies. So this is this is when this is when this this influx of mm, of migrant laborers start to come to the cities and Beijing, Shanghai, other big cities, they're not built by the the inhabitants of the city. They are not built by Shanghainese or 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 Beijingese. Yeah, Shanghai's I got told so many times by Chinese friends the the Shanghainese in Shanghai are minority, yeah. and they think that they're, they're the the royalty. Yeah, they are. They don't they want are, to deal with those, those cities are 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 built by the rural workers, the migrant workers, and you know when when it comes to females, lots of them, lots of them, you know, the I do not wish to generalize at that point, but selling selling body, selling selling your own body, after very strict very strict rules about that in Maoist China started being a thing when things started to open up and reform. Uh, women from rural areas, they went to the cities and started to to make any money to send, to send back home. And this is what actually happens in Levin. And, and sorry, not Levin and Lenin's kisses. 
living in, in the place that they withdraw from the society. And once they rejoin the society, all they actually have to offer is their bodies, even though they are deformed. Even though they are deformed, the the only thing that they that that can, that they can do is this. Uh, sorry for the word freak show, mm. and 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 this is what the alien case sees as a as the modernization pattern in China for for the rural work for the rural people from for the countryside. Yeah, it's. I I think I've said this before on the show, but um, China defeats a lot of um at least again like i think western european ideas of what left and right is because like here in the uk the most a left-wing party that can get into government i.e the labor party can do as far as traditional leftist things is add to bolster repair the welfare state we don't really do nationalized industry anymore uh, class struggle, absolutely not, not, not in the 21st century Labour Party. So there's this idea, I think, a default idea that the more left you are, the more of a social safety net you have. But China, a communist country, so in the default thinking, the furthest left you can go, as it stands today, does not have anything like this, the social safety net we have here in the UK. So I don't know what supports there for disabled people, but for these rural disabled people in the villages it doesn't feel perhaps i'm sure it's a cartoonish exaggeration but what they go to do to try and keep you know sustain themselves and what they get used for does not feel shocking to me because i never got the sense living in uh, living in china i got the sense i was in a very stable country but i did not get the sense this is a country that has a you know a sort of post-war style western welfare state as i understand it it did have something like that under mao but with reform and opening it's it's stripped away well i wouldn't i wouldn't call uh maoist model welfare uh well no. uh welfare state uh, i mean the the healthcare was was free and yeah and at some points uh well people switched the communes but we we all know the history we all know the history yeah, so i success. would rather i would i would prefer to point out the fact that the I, the irony of yen yang k's position in china is that his is, is that his leftist or left side concern concern about the underprivileged may be may be considered may be considered subversive by com by the communist party of china in fact in fact he continues the tradition of modernist writers from the fourth may period uh, lu xun and uh, and and many others and and many others but uh, well nowadays it's it's not a it's not a path to follow it's not a path to follow to to voice to voice these kind of these kind of concerns on chinese literary stage yeah it's uh it's not it's maybe a place where you can only really champion the working classes in the abstract not through doing many concrete things at a large scale i think that's as as much as i wanted to talk about like the social criticism of the stages of history now i thought we could zoom in on marginalized people i guess the conversation was going there anyway um so a spicy question this is a book that focuses on actually rewind rewind i remembered there was something i wanted to say um about the question of selling yourself this is a little bit of a uh detour so i'll get us back to marginalized people but um the small town i lived in my first year in china or it was called Wukang in Duqing County. And I was told that um, you won't see any, or at least very many, like brothels in Duqing, like suspicious massage parlors, because the mayor of Duqing was a woman. And she one of the things she had done was do away with um, with all those things. And I think it does match my experience. I think once I, well, when I was visiting other places or when I moved 
later to Shanghai, I did feel that there was a lot more of these dodgy looking massage parlors. And the reason I'm mentioning this is that the leader of Livin is a woman too, who's been through, uh, <laughs> what can you say? She has a sort of a party uh, pedigree. She's, I forget exactly what it was, but she has some, was it that she fought in the Civil War or something? But she's got that sort of status that makes her symbolize the the outside powers, the party, but she is absolutely standing up for the local people whenever she can. I don't really have anywhere to take that, but I just wondered if you want to say anything about her before I go on to talk about disability. Well, yeah, I mean, she's actually one of the two main characters of the story, not the one that I wish to wish to focus on when we when we move on. But um, yeah, he is actually the one that brings the that brings this community back to the world. And if we take this interpretation at some angle, uh, the it it actually has very uh, very subversive very controversial subtones because mm. if we think of living community the one that lived outside the society and uh, remained unaware of any historical events that were taking place all around her and she came all and lived, let's say, with all the communist ideas and all the disasters and calamities followed once she encouraged the people of living to join the society. This is, well, some could say that this is in a way what happened to China. If you, if you wish to really be anti-CCP, or anti this the the way that thing went on in China in the twentieth century. I mean the communists were they there were really few of them. Well they started as a group of six or twelve. They had very scanty resources and they had no theoretically they had no chance to win. So so they were just one uh, drop in the ocean of Chinese people. And this is this is this is what happened to Levin in a way that there was one single person that came with this with this utopian idea of 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 freedom, equality, and living happily ever after. And and she managed to convince them. And well, you could say that this is what the the party did with the people. Even though this political interpretation is somehow weakened by the fact that the Mao Zhe, this heroine, was rather was rather healthy one, let's say, and people from the outside world were the healthy normal ones, those let's say let's say communists living all around living were the healthy ones and the ones living in living in, in in the village were in a way disabled and deformed. So bringing them back into the society was a way to make them a part of this regular normal, uh, let's say, but not mean it, uh, way. And this, this fact somehow weakened this interpretation, but we we could think of this figure in that way. But Maoji is also, uh, because there is this chain of strong female characters in the novels. And sadly, we have to, we have to notice, we cannot help but notice that every single one of them is being raped in the course of the novel, both Maoji and her yeah. daughter, and then her granddaughters, uh, four of them. Each of them, each of them is abused. And I was just gonna say, reading uh, stuff by authors from Yan Yanka's generation, all the writers who hit their stride after, like the what eighties and nineties post cultural revolution, who were writing about 
you know, they were, I guess, they they had a window where they could get big writing some stuff that did look critically at the past. And a thing I noticed is, yeah, if there's a woman in one of these guys' novels, you can bet she's going to be at least harassed. It's very likely she'll she'll be subject to rape. Like, I've not read a huge amount of authors like that, of that generation, like Yuhua. I've not read any Yuhua fiction, actually. Mo Yan, Jia Pinghua, Yan Yanke. And yeah, there's a lot of rape. Uh, it, it's you, it's hard to miss. I I do not want to go into any kinds of justification of that. I mean, maybe maybe they consider it a kind of metaphor of what happened to China in general, to Chinese women. Some of some of the authors they they do effort to to put forward, let's say, the position of female characters. But some of them, but some of them do not. Well, some of them are unreadable in 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 Western terms when it time, yeah. when it comes to this uh, to this fe- to the feminist uh, sensitivity. I could I could name let's say Brothers by Yuhua. This is a disaster when it comes to what he does with female characters and. And this is this is why I mean I, there there are some people already like discouraged with those big big heroes of Chinese literature and those those uh, the, we have three big names translated to the West. This is Moyen Yuhua and Yan Yang Ke. Some some people that actually know something about Chinese literature, they are like, okay, enough of them. They are kind of boomers. And, and 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 they they do not they do not manage to grasp to grasp uh, any other perspective than Han male perspective. I cannot fully agree with that. I mean, it it requires some case study, and uh, in, in 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 many different novels, those this unfolds in a different manner. But yeah, people are are more eager to see some other voices, uh, female voices, or 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 other voices that used to be peripheral ones in Chinese literature and in translations from Asian literature to the Western languages. Boomer, I'd never thought of calling those guys boomers. That's funny. Yeah, it's re- it's reductive to reduce them to being like Han guys of a certain age, like. And it's reductive to say all their works are the same. Like the the only Moyen I've read is Radish, like I said, and that's like nothing else I've read for this podcast, except maybe uh, another short book published in translation by Penguin. Oh God, Go Fei's Flock of Brown Birds. They've got the same hallucinogenic feeling. It's more subtle in Radish, but like I would never call that, you know, verbal rapey vomit from a boomer that's a really magical sensitive book that touched me deeply it's not got the kind of grotty feel that so much of lenin's kisses does so yeah um i realize again i'm i'm leading us on a great big sidetrack so i'm going to get back to that question i said i would get to and this is maybe relevant to what you said about western sensibilities about so yeah you have um uh like you said western sensitivities about depictions of rape in fiction that's about as sensitive as you can get. Uh, Disability is obviously another sensitive topic. It's an important uh, axis of marginal identity. So this book focuses very heavily on disabled people, but do you think that would make today's Western disability activists pleased, or do you think they'd be upset at what they read in the book? I know this is a difficult question, or this is a a question you might want to reinterpret before answering. Well, I don't. I don't have their perspective. I don't have their, yeah, their perspective. But I, I can imagine. I can imagine that this whole idea of 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 forming a circus troupe, a circus troupe that some of them, that some of that Yan Yan K himself does not hesitate to call himself a freak show, a freak show, mm-hmm. may may be outrageous and the the feeds that they have like the the, the parts of the show they are this is not what a regular circus looks like so 
And so I would like to offer I would like to offer some arguments to for those that may feel that that this this was deeply unfair that that the novel is is in a way deeply unfair to disabled people. First thing is, uh, well, if I would like to refer to another book by Yan Yan K, this is Dream of Ding Village, great novel, probably the best he he has ever wrote, and this one was based on his on his research of AIDS villages. This thing happened in, in Henan province. Uh, so it, it started as a kind of anthropologist uh, research. And I, reading this novel and like knowing the context of him writing it, we certainly know that the guy is able, I mean, he, he can offer some sympathy and if that's not enough, I mean, if if some some of the readers may read and say, I I cannot see that. I mean, what what does it have to do with anything? Uh, we I would like to point that that uh, that Yin and K and this and this dichotomy between entering the world and uh, leaving the world brings up brings up this this notions that are rooted in Taoism, in Taoist philosophy. And even though he is he is like socially engaged writer, this kind of this kind of dream of seclusion, of, of this going back, of this of slowing down this modern modernization, uh, has to do has to do a lot with with Taoist ideas, and I could point out like Zhuangzi and Laozi. And as Zhuangzi observes, all men know the advantage of being useful, but no one knows the advantage of being useless. And when when we follow when we follow the when we follow the plot the plot line the story, we we notice that. When the people with the people of living live in, when they live in uh, in the small community, they seem to be spontaneous, pure, natural, and happy, um, most of all. But after after their skills or are discovered, what what can they do or what can be done with their bodies, they they turn into the very opposite of it of it they become deliberate they become they become greedy alienated and unhappy and mm -hmm. they and that is because of that that they they are disconnected from their true nature from what they what they used to be and trying to trying to inform some patterns of normality of of regular of following some kind of social order or ideas about the social roles is what is what may may make these people unhappy and in and in, in that way i think yan yang k stands in defense of them well if you if you find my argument fair enough then you you may say that maybe that maybe that would not leave the activists unhappy at least right your interpretation there has really given me a, a missing jigsaw piece because i was trying to work out like okay so yan Nianko, he clearly is not going to give a pass to mao's style communism because he's more than ready to depict the awful mishaps it caused but he's clearly not all that keen on the like commercialization, marketization, the making crass of society into like buying and selling and accumulating money. That's a big part of what the book is criticizing. So then, and so these are easy sort of isms to, to you know, one is socialism, one is capitalism, but very, 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 very simply. But then what ism is withdrawing from society? Is it some kind of like Luddite 
anti-technology thing? Is it some kind of anar like localist anarchism? But actually, no, it makes more sense to call it, I think, like you said, some kind of Taoism, Taoism of like, do nothing, stillness, don't try too hard. And it makes total sense that that way of being gets totally wrecked by both hardcore Mao style communism and also the market because for Maoism the whole thing is like a rush isn't it build 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 both your ideas and like agrarian and industrial production so it's not an ideology that's good at taking its hands off and then capitalism although there's there's this uh people who are for it would say it's a laissez-faire it's a hands-off ideology the reality is no that's nonsense because capitalism is all about maximizing optimizing exploiting things as far as they'll go i work for a magazine for the pharmaceutical industry and pretty much everyone i interview they can't stop talking about optimizing things it's um <laughs> sometimes it's amazing sometimes it de it's a depressing uh what's the word um tunnel vision that they can't talk about anything else yeah the very vocabulary of it of of, yeah. of, of those processes of optimizing stuff or or making things efficient yeah i'm not noticing that as well but we have been talking for a while and we mm. we haven't yet we haven't yet mentioned quite subversive part of the book also utopian but i wouldn't call yan yan k like full full dream of communism kind of guy like but this this uh, bringing back uh, this Taoist reminded me that in fact Levin, the the village, managed to dispel all the classes, all the social classes be before before Karl Marx even raised his pen to you know to come up with the notion with the very notion mm -hmm. of it because they they have lived like this for for centuries and it worked and I even prepared one uh, quote from Zhuang Zhe because I think it fits. So his vision of a utopian society is the following. The people had their constant nature. They were all one in this and did not form themselves into separate, separate classes. They lived in accordance with their natural tendencies. So this is, this is basically what could be for for the for for communism when it reaches its final stage and this is actually what what has been happening all the time in Levin before 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 Maoist China like the counties around Levin realized that hey we I mean this is where we're going but I mean, this is guys your fault that you haven't managed to find a single landlord, you know, and and the, and the tables turn. But yeah, let's not let's not for, forget that that this is moving from one utopia to another one, and and this is as since you asked me about this important tropes of Yin Yang Kai's writing, I think this is this constant utopia i mean in every novel there is the he says that yan yang kei says that chinese are not religious people but they are really willing to engage in in some kind of shared dream shared vision because how else would you would you explain everything that happens after 1949 if that's not like like a like a simulacrum, like shared religion, shared shared vision, uh, whatever whatever you call it, or this utopian belief, utopian belief, and this is this is also what we have. I mean, they all live all haulers, so the healthy people in the novel and the living, so the people live in village, the people with disabilities, uh, they either live in utopia already or they wish to strive towards the another one. Oh, I had a thought and now it's gone. What was it? Oh yes, I remember what it was. So what you were saying about how 
their contact with the PRC outside of them sort of damages their classless society, their like kind of Taoist style um, peaceful society. So it reminds me, I don't, I think I, the only Karl Marx I've read like firsthand is his some of his angry letters to people he didn't like. Everything else I've I've learned through secondary sources, but I know he's got this early writing about the division of labor and how he's criticizing it. So he's coming up with some kind of kind of a fantasy of the past, kind of kind of a description where before industrial society sets in and everyone has to work, everyone gets divided into one role where you do one thing because that's that's optimal and efficient. Before that, you could be a guy who could go fishing in the morning and collect his crops in the afternoon and divide his time as he pleases. But under capitalism, like me, you do one job, you're an editor, and that's that's not really for the benefit of yourself. That's for the benefit of the economic order. And yeah, I, the, not, I don't think that has much of a bearing on the book, but it's just interesting that communist governments have never tried to do away with division of labor because they've got to get rid of scarcity first, and well, it, it, that's not it been done. That's have actually something to do with the book because when the officials bring Mao Zedong for interrogations, they ask they ask how how is that possible that you had stuff to eat, and how is that possible that a that a guy without both of not having his legs without his legs was able to plow his fields and they would they would explain that they shared that the it, it wasn't like one person would do same stuff every day but they would right. they would they live interconnected and they would jump in and help out each other and this is how it all you know uh, and they succeeded in having as much as they needed and maybe some more than that. So this di- division of labor like happened spontaneously. This happened and it was based on like social relations, but with no social classes, with no oppression, with no with no uh, added currency, like money, with, with no money. So it was like right. pre. It was kind of ancient in the sense that they worked on barter, like exchange markets, in, instead of mm. uh, regular financial one. But 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 still, this is like the it, like the in fact this utopia of living is quite elaborated in in the novel, and we should. We should we should point we should point to that. I'm gonna fast forward us a little bit because I got a lot of questions that we've all kind of answered about two thirds or or hundred percent of the way. I'll just skim through them. So we had a section about censorship. We've already talked a lot about that. So my questions I had in the censorship section were, what in the book would upset the censors? What might trouble Western readers? We talked a bit about that. I had another one about like what a Chinese official might like about Yan Lian Ke's work. Or like, at the very least, how come he's not in jail? So rather than asking you any one specific question, I'll just throw those all out there and you can grab whatever is interesting to you to comment on. I I don't really know what would upset Chinese censors since they did not block the novel from appearing. And uh, on top of that, uh, they, it earns quite a lot of critical acclaim and some and some prizes uh, prizes uh, happened to Yan Yan K after that 2004 Lao Xia prize is like the second most prestigious uh, really that's so yeah so, now that you mention it I realize I have seen Chinese editions of this book so hmm. and, it, and this the Chinese editions of the book also has like uh, I came across that they have kind of like paper cutting with 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 some folk uh, customs and and words. Okay, let's let's not get into that because I do not remember uh, clearly, so I don't want to rumble without without making a point. So, well, as I as I mentioned, there are some things that are that are 
person that maybe thinks uh, controversial or critical the system or the way the things are in China, but as as we see as we see they they were not all eventually to be that anti-system as as hardcore as other as other novels that followed that followed okay. i think that the the most of things that were censored in china written by yin yang k uh, happened after that after the after right. kisses and but and what would travel western readers well, I think that maybe this idea of odd numbers and this name of a uh, cycle of life of, of a tree that we have the seed. Uh... Yeah, like the, the, he did this in uh, The Day the Sun Died as well. Like the chapters are structured in a kind of, I would say, like almost convoluted way where you have like book one and then you have within book one, you have like chapter one, footnote one. And I find it personally, I find it exhausting. <laughs> oh yeah, and also yeah, there's no even numbers in the chapter titles. It's like one, three, five. They are really like long parts. If, for instance, when they say how much money would they make, and they keep multiplying that. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. these are these are like so tiresome. If I if I were to translate it, I would probably re-edit re-edit it. It so yeah. Well, I'm sorry to say that. I know it is like really against the offer, but when when they say uh, that, let's say one million RMB equals to something, two million RMB equals to something, it's like okay, we we get the idea, and <laughs> and but this is yeah. this is the way they they kind of write, and this is like I could really talk about that because uh, like editing. The novels in China is not like their strong side because because of many reasons. I am not going to get too much into that. Okay, I just lost my track of questions, but I actually do have one question for you. Uh, well, good, good. I might good, good, have I might have you know asked or you know warned you beforehand, but okay. What, how do you think where where do those kisses come from? I mean, I know I know you could not trans you, we could not translate the title of the novel because it's the name of the village uh, or the verb that is living. Oh, yeah, uh, literally. So you had to came up with something creative. So yeah, bringing bringing up uh, the figure of Lenin. Is kind of a good idea, but where, why, why kisses? Where, where does this kisses. come from? Any idea? I will quickly throw something in before I answer it, and it's about the year the Chinese edition came out, two thousand and four. So this is a book that came out long before the Xi Jinping era. So that might be one possible explanation why, like, if this came out on like right now under Xi, maybe it would not make it to publication, whereas two thousand four maybe it would. Anyway, I know I've snuck, sneaked that one past you because I'm going to answer your question. So, Shuo uh, Huo, fortunately for readers like me, Carlos Rojas goes into this word a bit in his intro. So he tells you they live in this village, Shuo Huo. And from what I remember, it, it if it translates to something, it's sort of like breath, but also like liveliness. Life, I think Huo is the Huo from Shong Huo, if, I'm, if yeah, I've got that right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and is Shuo like Shuo as in to speak? Shuo Hua? Uh, it's, no, it's, it it's, Shuo? It's, it's not. It's not the character. It's Shou. It's like ah, to right. receive. Shou. Yeah. So it is. Stupid me. <laughs> yeah. So to receive life, I can't. I might be misremembering this, but I think he says it's. Well, it's it's used in the book. It's used to mean like uh, the word like enliven. So living, liven, enliven is used to describe a lot of things like feeling sort of comfort, feeling happiness, feeling excitement, and it's also used just a few times as a euphemism for sex. 
they're enlivening each other. Yes, yes. yes. So I wonder mm -hmm. if he's sprinkled that in. And I can't remember. I might. This might just be my dirty mind. I think he might have implied it was also a euphemism for like a blowjob as well. But that might just be my dirty mind. Yeah, right. I so, don't know. <laughs> so, so you're saying that 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 those kisses kind of like bring in this sense of enlivening as a as kissing as a part of of, of like sharing, something of sharing a little, this energy, a little bit of free song, and I think. The book doesn't really reflect that at all. It's not. It's not a saucy book, really at all. Not like for, like I've not read Serve the People, but as I understand it, some of his other books do go there into sexual stuff. But I kind of wonder if like he suggested some titles to the publisher, and the publisher saw Lenin's Kisses and were like, "Ooh, sexy communism. We'll we'll go for that title." And then the cover of the English edition, there's a woman like pursing her lip. I don't know if the microphone picked that one up for the listeners. Like, pursing her lips, like she's blowing a kiss. And, like, I just think from a publishing perspective, these guys want to sell the book, and they might have the final say on the English title. That's my feeling. Mm, yeah, but uh, on the cover there is a work of uh, renowned painter, Chinese painter. Uh, mm. But yeah, yeah, I I must agree that from the Western perspective, let's say, the title is catchy. It is yeah, it's, it's a kind good of title. gimmicky to me, and I really, if 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 it were me to translate it, I would really reconsider that choice. But in Polish translation, the novel appeared under exactly the same name. Uh, in Polish, obviously, it's how oh, like, how the Lenina, which means technically the same thing. So, so yeah, right. and I'm not entirely happy with 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 that title. I must say. So just, I'm not sure if I mis misunderstood. So the the Polish title is just the Polish version of Lenin's Kisses. Yes, correct. I mean, no, no effort to renegotiate it with the with the Chinese original. Interesting. Yeah, so English has led the way that, I mean that can happen quite literally literally with bridge translations where like let's say uh okay I'm gonna pick a random country. Uh Ghana. A Ghana uh, edition of Lenin's Kisses comes out and maybe they couldn't find someone who could translate from uh Chinese to the language of Ghana, but they could find someone who could translate from English. So the whole thing would come via English. Uh, just like the title did there. But yeah, I th I think I agree. It is a cool title for a book, but I think it is too sexy and too cool for this book, which is not... It's quite a grim book. I don't know. It's a bit too cheeky for a book that I didn't find to be a very cheeky read, personally. It was a quite serious book, I thought. Well, there is some kind of grotesque humor to that. I mean... Yeah, I guess it didn't work on me. I must say that picking a piece, the piece of music for that is the hardest task and the hardest question you've given me. You're doing a better job than me in keeping us moving. Yeah. So I picked for our miscellaneous section, I picked a, a word of the day and a piece of music to pair with the book. So I've got both of my choices ready. You can start with the word of the day. I've picked uh, the word for dog go but also i've doubled it up with uh i guess like a meme or at least it was a meme when i was living in china it's probably moved on now but go die uh and that literally is go is dog die is like a lead but it's also a homonym for telling someone to go die in english and i picked that because there isn't a, my favorite section of the book is where malju the like our heroine the the one who's clinging on to sort of utopian ideas about brotherhood and sisterhood of man. She's, I think she's like really at her wit's end. Things have gone wrong and she notices a starving dog is following her and she tries to shoo it off, but it starts following her. And she, because she's like a good hearted person, she can't not help it and feed it. And then all these other pitiful dogs come to her and she can't help but care for them all. And then they're following her around town and Maybe I was just desperate for something to become emotionally attached to in the book because I hadn't attached to anything, but that scene really moved me. But also, like, I've gone for Go Die because, oh my god, it's just... I found the book to be such a a drudge and so many miserable 
depressing scenes, so that's why I went for Go Die. What about yourself? Do you have a word of the day? Well, yeah, I actually have more than one. So, oh, uh, awesome. so first thing, first one is definitely the title, Shouhua, since it say a word that comes from the dialect. And this is a kind of, uh, well, thing, well, kind of a thing worth mentioning to the readers. Like the, this huge variety of Chinese dialects and the, that, that Chinese language is not like one unified language. And this, this, those shifts of meanings of this, of those same two characters, Shaofu, that happened throughout the novel, that is both, they have also, that it's the name of the village, it's the title of the book, it also has some uh, sexual connotations, but it's, people are also in living in a sense that they are happy, like, people in, in living are in living because of the unlivening, they take it, and 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 in this way they are connected to their real and living nature. Like you, you could go on and on and on, but this is this the shouhua is like the shortest way to describe the state that people of living uh, were in had had been in before 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 the things started to happen before Mao Ji came to the village and started to ask them, I mean, convince them to to become uh, the part of society again. And another one is a set of, uh, is a set of two uh, contrast, contrast words, like contrasting, contrasting, words, yeah. contrasting words is a, is a zhu and true ship, true ship. Mm, yes. So it's it it technically it literally means entering the world or leaving the world, and this is a very long tradition of discussing the discussing the the right way of an intellectual in China to engage with the world, either to engage with it fully. And to be part of it, and by bringing your example, uh, try to change it. It's more a Confucian right. way. So this is this zhu uh, zhu shi. Yes, and is it these characters I just sent you? Yes, these are yeah, right. these are the ones, and and the very contrast of it is zhu shi, and this is Taoist way to go for seclusion. And this is what mm. this is what Chinese literate, Chinese mandarins, Chinese intellectuals would do when they were when they felt disappointed with their emperor, the emperor with 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 the government. They would just leave and live the secluded life, or they would just sit in the garden, sit and watch, sit and read, sit and contemplate. And and this novel, Yen Yang K, seems to be like sitting on the fence between those two options, and we have, we have, and um, we have like very similar analogy to that in, in the novel when we have, uh, when we have Zhu Shi and Chu Shi, so enter the society or uh, enter the society and dispel from the society, right? Uh, I think yeah, that's the way it is translated. It. So this is this is this is one of obviously many keys to interpret the story, but this one goes really way back, and I found this one like extremely interesting. Like let's let's let us not remember, let us not forget that being a Ch Chinese writer means not only commenting on the contemporary, but also the like digging into like this huge heritage of continuous cultural tradition, and this is this is what they this is what they all do, uh, as 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 far as I, as I've read them. Maybe maybe some of them don't, but 
most of them really do and and it really takes some i don't know patience or no i'm not gonna say what what does it take but let's 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 keep ourselves open to that yeah i think you, the, if i'd known or if someone had pointed this out to me before i started the book i think it would have added something because seeing these the two words the four characters there in front of me it makes it feel much more real than like uh reading a the slightly clunky translation where characters go on at length about whether or not to withdraw from society or enter you know it's only four characters it's just that little bit more concise i'm also i'm gonna defend myself here about reading <laughs> mispronouncing uh shuhua as shuhua because in the there is an error in the copyright contents page of this book they've gone to the effort to put the pinyin name of the chinese edition in but they've spelt it shuohua instead of shuohua i think i've made this mistake before and i just forgotten that i made it before oh yeah i'm i yeah. am seeing it right now i have it open yeah. in a different card and yeah first published in chinese as shuohua 2004 Oops. yeah i agree that was naughty of them or silly of them uh, I'll take us on to our next uh, our next question, also a silly one. So, if you could pair the piece of uh, the story with a piece of music, and I've picked a kind of peaceful track, "Never Green" by Emancip Emancipator, who's like he makes. I guess you would. I think he has done like beats for rappers. It's that sort of repetitive style. sort of artist was made popular by YouTube. People who were looking for something, for chill beats to relax and study to, basically. It's it's very peaceful. The album cover has like a... looks like a sort of Alaskan mountainside or something. It's very beautiful and secluded and verdant. There's a good word. Verdant. Uh, you could imagine uh, a Taoist uh, re retreating out there to become an immortal or what have you. But there's something bittersweet in that title, Never Green. I don't know if he was just trying to be clever, but there is a feeling of melancholy, I think, in the music as well. And I thought that resonated with the village of Livin, in that it has this utopia, but it's going to be spoiled. It's going to go from evergreen to never green. So that's why I picked that. All right. I mean, I am only... I am on a completely different side with that but this question okay. this question i must say has been killing me for for the past few <laughs> days uh, because i am faintly aware of what's happening in chinese music in general i'm really sorry as much as i love chinese literature i just I just cannot bring myself to listen to it. Not because no not because I believe like it's 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 so bad. It's just I just have my uh, I just have my ways and habits about the music and I I think I'm just hard to reform. But I really believe that that this this novel uh, deserves some Chinese song. Since since the story is basically about the grassroots folks, blues came 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 to my mind. But but obviously there is no way of comparing Chinese countryside to to the American experience and and like the whole context of of how blues emerged in the United States. But then I then I remembered that that they that there there is some blues in China well technically and technically they are copycats <laughs> it's uh, i'm not it's i i wouldn't say it's so great but there is this guy Zhang Ling he used to be a bassist of Cui Jian Cui Jian he's a like forefather of chinese rock he took parts in oh, yeah. Tiananmen protests so some of yeah. some of 
uh, some of the advanced listener may well it may ring some bell to them. So this, yeah, I've heard of Switch. So yeah. this Jungling, uh, he he played he played the bass in Swayjan's band, and then he switched to blues. The one that kind of fits, that kind of fits is the one by Zhang Ling that is called the perfect revival plan. Don't, don't get, don't get, uh, you know, mistaken. It's sung in Chinese despite the title, but there is something, there is something, uh, well, ironical to it because, well, what's, what was supposed to happen to live in the whole Balo Mountain region was to be revived, revived, yeah. So, and I I don't know the exact like lyrics of it, but but the singer sings that his perfect plan is to go and never come back, and this is what they actually wanted to do. The the inhabitants of Liven that they wanted to leave leave, and when they started making money. They they had like really hard times of of to to say okay that's enough that's enough and and well and this is what what Ch China's perfect revival plan seemed to be for some time like let people earn some money let them show what it's like how nice it is and when they stick to it you know they will be with us as long as we create proper conditions for them to get richer and richer then you know china china will be back will be back in the game and so this this is kind of my uh, thought bubble the you know the, those links that i made just to just to the title of it so yeah i hope you are going to like at least one of these two songs by uh well, I think of the I think the first figures of Chinese blues. Yeah. Uh, now, next miscellaneous question. This is one for Patreon, so I'll be snipping this one out and putting it on the translated Chinese fiction Patreon account for supporters there. So no pressure here. The question is almost a challenge. Could you describe what your ideal society outside of society would be? And I'm making an extra rule that you've got to build your your society outside of society, either inside modern China or somewhere sort of near it. I have an idea here, but I'm curious what yours might be. Well, you can you can store it so I can warm up, but I promise not to okay. you know not to copy your <laughs> your, okay. your ideas. Right. So I believe the place I'm going for is Nashville. I think that's probably all for the bonus question. Uh, I'll just take us on to our final questions now. So it's the further reading questions. So one is, if you were going to give our listeners more books like Lenin's Kisses, where would you point them to? Uh, well, <clears throat> I, don't want, I don't want to sound lazy, but uh, first... <laughs> The first thing that you need to do is to actually read two other novels by Yin Yang K. And what I am referring to is the four books and Dream of Thing Village. I mean, the the problems are you could point out similarities, but they are way more succinct and. I think that they are way more complete in in terms of like artistic or in terms of the artistic delivery, like the the ways of the ways of expression. 
you know, the way of express, expression. So I think you could, you could start with that. And if you give me like uh, 30 seconds, I could, you know, uh, scroll through my list quickly. And, and sure. just in case there is like, let's say one more or two more to, to name. Yeah. I'll give my recommendation while you're doing that. I would go for something a little bit different just because I think it's more readable. Uh, by one of those authors of the same generation I mentioned, uh, Jia Pinghua, he's got a book. Uh, in English, its name is Happy Dreams. Um, the Chinese name is just Gaoxing, uh, Happy. And I really liked it, I think for two reasons. Number one, the translation, I think, was much more readable than Linus Kisses. It's a Nikki Harmon translation. Uh, not just saying that because she's cool. I think she writes readable books, or she translates readable books, rather. Uh, the story is about much more focused on one character and his his story, but he's a member of the underclass. He's uh he's from I think if not the mountains then the rural rural uh Shanxi rather than Hunan, but from a similar economic background, and he heads into the city to become a trash worker. So he's in a similar sort of grotesque abstract zone. Uh, we go into some similar things about selling your body. Uh, but it's a bit more grounded. It's not trying to be mythopoetic. I, I'm not norm like realist fiction is not normally my biggest uh, joy in in reading, but I find that to be a pretty readable book because although it's pretty chunky, I got through it quite fast, which is usually a good sign. I know Japingwa. I know Nikki Orman. She she is both a great person and great translator. But I haven't read Japingwa's work. I read Chen She Was, and I think some others oh, yeah. that she translated but right now i'm thinking of um, well if you are looking for something that is both lyrical and kind of utopian slash dystopian because you know that's not one thing i i think that one thing cannot exist without the other like if you depict some utopia in a way you you just you just express even if not like directly all the things that you are scared of like coming ahead in the future of of the dystopian world that you think may happen so what you want to go to or go back to into utopia you know uh in a way forms like the 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 upside down like in stranger things and I right now I am reading Shen Kei, Chinese author, right. author uh, female Chinese author, a great one. Uh, so I think if you are looking for something of this type, I could say Death Fugue, Fug, uh, that's a name of I think Fugue, Fugue. Yeah. yeah, of a musical composition. That Fugue, try try with that and. Well, should I waste your time? Accept my apologies, but I think you will not. I think you will not. Okay, awesome. Right, and the very final question: uh, What are you reading just now? Well, like I just said, I am in my Shanghai phase, uh, so right now yeah. I'm reading Northern Girls, Bei Chao, oh, yeah. and right. Well, what what is distinctive about the novel is actually its realism. Because when we have those books translated from China, there is always some sort of uh, play with the form in order to avoid something controversial or make it make it invisible to censorship or make it kind of creative uh, artistic creation that tells us something else. But this this uh, this very dynamic period of opening up and of this people going to cities and being well let's say that out loud used being used you know the moment they arrive it's it's not very common to write just in this not not like core realism that is that is so brutal in order to you know to to feel outraged but rather in this manner that you actually engage with engage with those characters and you go with them through the struggles and there's there's just nothing more to that there's just the story to follow uh, but 
but the, this is a kind of story that you actually think okay okay this is you, you feel like okay this is the this is the climate that you know that was all around there in china in 80s and 90s when everybody was crazy about getting rich maybe 90s or quite different from 80s but i'm not gonna go into that but right. we I'm, i I'm, i haven't read anything like so realistic like in in, in terms of formal way of writing and at the same time fresh uh fresh and kind of pretty direct not forcing itself to be more artistic than it needs to be uh anything quite like that uh, from china in a long while that's why i'm 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 actually loving it northern girls by shang kai excellent and i will really what i'm reading it's um a non-fiction if i could link it to lenin's kisses it would be the idea of uh getting rich to get rich is glorious it's the silver way uh sorry it's called the silver way china spanish america and the birth of globalization 1565 to 1815 it's all about the trade routes that opened up between spain and portugal to china and i don't really think like i'm not going to be able to link it to maoism or disability but just the mad and i'm only about a fraction of the way through but like the mad rush for money is is totally there although in this book it's sort of framed as an interesting force that opened up connections that it um brought about i guess it i haven't got to this point yet but i know the modern sutron peppercorn is a hybrid that is one part of that hybrid is like a mexican plant and that is not so surprising that wouldn't be surprising to you after you read this book because the connection with spain that was opened up the connection between spain and china was opened up via the new world sailing from mexico to like or uh, i think maybe like guangzhou or macau maybe tronjo so like i don't know it's got i can't relate it to lenin's kisses at all but this is right up my alley the um connections between different groups of people uh different parts of the world different cultures that are not the ones we expect so it's not like the 100th retelling of the opium war or the silk road this is something a bit different and it takes all my boxes well i know that you as 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 the host are going to give some final remarks but if i if i may i thought of a kind of a close up to go to, for it and they come back to actually what we started with uh, when you asked me about uh, literature politics and philosophy like and choosing mm. between the latter two and great thing great thing about uh, to to comment on what you're reading right now a great thing about uh, getting to know china is when you read non fiction you are actually getting smarter about reading its literature and this is like the simplest way i could i could explain i could explain this correlation uh, between politics and literature and history and literature in like one sentence without going into into like specific notions history blah 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 and you know mindsets like one uh, like one sentence like reading non fiction helps just 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 helps like makes you smarter about any any literature book that you pick after that so uh, so i uh, so every few novels that i read i also you know bring take take some books on on Xi Jinping on recent politics on historical politics on economy or whatever it it, it all helps in in a, in a way and i know that you could say that about any other place in the world but i really it's it's i really would it's hard for me to imagine that you know when you read about like i don't know China, american financial markets and then you go read let's say anyone from the from the states like i don't know colson whitehead or or whoever just name any then then it helps you in in any manner well in chi well in in china it does for some reason 
either one or like link of many complex reasons. Uh, the reason I like reading history uh, books rather than say like a book of a guy's political thoughts, although I might enjoy those, is to me history feels like raw material. It's it can it's great if it's written in an engaging way, but if it is just a pure data download, me learning about a story of part of the world I didn't know before, I'll just always find it interesting and it is very likely to feed into either a conversation I'll have in the future or if it's Chinese history or the, even a history of a country on China's borders, like a history of Kazakhstan. I feel like if I read a history of Kazakhstan, that's going to help me on this podcast at some point, somehow. It may, might not be obvious at the time, but, um, you know, it all it feeds, everything feeds back in some way or other eventually. I think I've taken your very nicely expressed idea and made it a big mess again, but... That's kind of the nature of the show. <laughs> well, I I love being being a part of the show. So yeah, no no need to apologize for for this great hosting. <laughs> awesome. I'll I guess I'll call it uh, call it into the interview there then. So just last thing, big thank you for coming on. Yeah, I mean it's it's been a pleasure, and I you know I just I once we're done, I'm gonna start thinking of some topic that you know i can i can i can give maybe for some next time and we've reached the end of the show not much left to do now except some plugs and the outro so i hope you really enjoyed that interview as much as i enjoyed doing it uh, speaking to piotr it was well you heard how good of a chat it was i know i always say this but i i do always mean it this time around i really liked how piotr brought in some you know some philosophers modern philosophers critical theory that i mean i said that in the interview but i actually mean that i, I need to try and do a little bit more of that myself uh, if, if you have any thoughts about what you'd like more of on the show then you can get in touch via social media um there's a twitter that's just my own twitter at angus likes words the show also has its own instagram at trichific t-r-c-h-f-i-c there's a link in the show notes to join the show's discord um be forewarned it's generally quite quiet but you can ask me a, well you can ask a question there and then me or any listeners who are in the discord can can pick up on it for you um maybe full-on conversations will go on there one day but we're, we're not there yet to be honest the show's got a Patreon if you want to support the show and get access to, could be going on a hundred bonus episodes now. I've not done a count for a long time, but I always put up the bonus questions, uh, answers onto Patreon and I do fairly regularly get things queued up, usually little solo things where I'm speaking from anywhere to like 15 to 50 minutes about a book I've just read or a thought I've had or something to do with translated Chinese lit. So there's that. And there's one other plug I'm going to do. I've not done this for a while. It's another good thing you can do to support the show, and that's to leave reviews on iTunes or other podcast providers. I, I believe iTunes is still like the the most powerful ranking you can get, but like Google Podcasts as well, just anywhere where you can give us the magic five stars, or you know what, I'd even accept four if you can say <laughs> if you can say some nice things about the show. That would be fab. Uh, of course, the best thing you can do to support the show is, in my opinion, is to tell people in real life. So tell your mum, <laughs> tell your dad, tell your village chief, tell the guy that's trying to bring an embalmed communist leader into your town. If it's Mao, then you should probably verify if that's a fake Mao or not. But in any case, tell anyone who will listen uh, to check out the show if, if you think they might be interested. That's all. I know it's not a very original ending, but on that note, Zai Jian. <laughs>